Hello, this is uh, Pastor Mark Anderson with King James Bible Church, and this is a re-recording of a message that we did on March the 13th, uh, 2022, that failed to record, so I'm going back over the material from that service and re-presenting uh, it so that you can have the material for this series. The subjects that we're going to be covering today in regards to redemption is the angel of the Lord. We're going to identify who that is and we're also going to talk about why it was necessary for God uh, to come and take on a human body and redeem mankind. And in the process of showing that, we're also going to be showing the necessity of Him coming and the fact that he is identified as the Redeemer. And then we're going to bring all that together and connect that with Jesus Christ. Um, and show that they are truly one and the same. So if you have your Bibles today, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 27, verse 23, we'll start there. <clears throat> Paul speaking, he says, There stood by me this night the angel of God. Whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. I want you to notice uh, real quickly in this passage here that Paul says that this angel of God that stood before him was the angel that he served and that whom he belonged to. He says, whose I am. Now we know from reading the scripture that Paul says that he was a servant of Jesus Christ. And sometimes he refers to himself as the servant of God or Paul, uh, apostle of Jesus Christ and a servant. So that's very important that you understand that this is no ordinary angel that Paul is referring to in Acts chapter 27. It is the angel that he serves. Now, we understand from the Gospel of Matthew, if you want to turn there real quick, I'll show it to you. In Matthew chapter 4, that Jesus Christ himself says that we are to worship the Lord our God and him only shall we serve. This is found in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. The Bible says, Then Jesus said, then saith Jesus unto him, referring to the devil, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So for Paul to say that this angel is somebody that he's serving, he's identifying the angel with God himself. Now, I know the question's going to come up. Well, why does it call him an angel then? It's a very, very good explanation for that and a very biblical explanation for that as we delve into this a little further. But real quickly, I want to give you a definition of the word angel. The word angel in the Bible means appearance of. So when we hear Paul say the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve, he's basically letting you know that God has appeared to him. It's the one he belongs to and it's the one he serves. Now take your Bible and let's see who this angel is. Because the Bible will define itself. In Galatians chapter 4, and please forgive me for my voice today, I'm getting over a sinus cold, and my voice is uh, real raspy as a result. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 14. 
The Bible says in Galatians 4.14, And my temptation which was in my flesh ye despise not, nor rejected, but received me, watch it, as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Now notice there, he identifies the angel with Jesus Christ. Even as Jesus, even as Christ Jesus, rather. <coughs> you say, well, preacher, why is that important? That's important because the Bible is going to tell you here that this angel is not a created angel. It is, in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is called the angel of the Lord. Several times in the Old Testament, he's referred to as that. Now let's go a little further. Let's go to Psalm 34, verse 7. Psalm 34, verse 7. Let me get over here real quick. Verse 7. And in verse 7, we read the following. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Now notice in this verse how the angel of the Lord is referred. What is said about him. It says the angel of the Lord encampeth round about. He's in front of them. He's behind them. He's around on each side of them. In other words, he's omnipresent. <clears throat> he's omnipresent. Now, that does not describe an ordinary created angel. Only God is omnipresent. Only God can be in front and in behind at the same time. Only the Lord can encamp round about something. That means he can be in more than one place at the same time. This angel of the Lord is described as such. And because of that, we understand in the Old Testament that in some places where it says God appeared to them, then in another passage describing the same event, it'll say, the angel of the Lord appeared to them. If you go back and study your Old Testament, this shows up several times. A good example of that is Moses in the burning bush. I always ask people, um, who showed up in the burning bush to Moses? A lot of people say, well, God's the one that talked to him. That's correct. But did you know your Bible says that it was the angel of the Lord that was in that bush and talked to him? And it also says God was in that burning bush talking to him. Interchangeably, it says God or the angel of the Lord. Now, let's go a little further. Let's go to Isaiah 63 verse 9. Isaiah 63, verse 9. In all their affliction. Well, let's go back a few verses. Let's look at verse 7. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord. According to all the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies, <clears throat> and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. I want you to note that. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. He's relating to them. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. 
and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. This is a description of the angel of his presence. And notice what the scripture says about it. It says that he saved them. He was their savior. He was afflicted when they were afflicted. And the Bible says in his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. So this angel of the Lord is connected to the redemption that is going to show up in the New Testament. That's what I want you to see. Now, <clears throat> here the Lord Jesus Christ is identified as the angel of the Lord in the above scriptures. And as such, he appears several times in the Old Testament as a theophany. That means a temporary appearance of God. That means that God uh, showed up temporarily in a human form to let them know that he was talking to them. Sometimes it would be in the form of a man walking through and talking. Or it would be in some other way where he was visibly present with them and manifested himself to them. But in those appearances, it wasn't permanent. In other words, he didn't stay around. <clears throat> he, he showed up, he said what he had to say, and he disappeared. But in the New Testament, for the sole purpose of redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ comes not just as a temporary appearance, but comes in the incarnation. Now that is very important that you note that as the incarnation, as a permanent manifestation required to complete the work of redemption. In other words, God is going to now do something different. He is not just going to make a temporary appearance and disappear. That's what he did in the Old Testament. He is going to show up and make a permanent appearance in a human body. He is going to manifest himself in such a way that he will be an eternal testimony of what God does in the plan of redemption. Take your Bible and look at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <laughs> And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to see the following recorded. And without controversy, very familiar passage, great is the mystery of godliness. God, underline it, was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. That's what God did in the plan of redemption. He shows up in a human body. He manifests himself in the flesh. <coughs> Excuse me. Alright, now take your Bible and let's... Let's see what the Bible says about that in other places. In John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 1. Again, another very familiar passage here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now notice what the Word is identified as. It is identified as God Himself. He not only is with God in the Incarnation, but He is God Himself in His deity. Okay? And God the Father and God the Son in eternity past are there together. That's why the word with is used there. 
Both are sharing the same nature, the Father and the Son. But now look at verse 14. The Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, <clears throat> and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus Christ. That is your Redeemer. And what God is telling you there in His Word is, what He did in the Old Testament as a temporary appearance, He shows up in the New Testament as a permanent residence in this flesh body. Now, let's look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I'm going to try to do this where my voice holds out. So I will go ahead and apologize in advance. If my voice sounds raspy and um, not too great, it is because of my um, sinus issues that I'm battling this week. And also, uh, because I have tried to record this message three times. <laughs> and two of the three times, I went all the way through the message. And when we went to go uh, drop it, it, it just, there wasn't anything there. So this will be the third attempt. Alright, <clears throat> Titus chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now, notice here in verse 13 that the Bible says that this great God and Savior is Jesus Christ. And then it says He gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us. Now we're going to talk about that giving Himself later in a little bit more detail, but right now the part I want you to notice is, it is the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came. It is the great God and Savior that's identified as Jesus Christ, that came to redeem us. That's very important. Alright. Now. It is God who is manifest. Because God alone. Can bring redemption. I want you to think about something for a minute. When you sinned. You offended God. When mankind fell into sin. They severed their relationship with God, and they severed their fellowship with God, and the reconciliation that has to be made cannot be done by another person. The one that you have offended is the one that you have to go and be reconciled with. The Bible says in the New Testament when Jesus is talking in Matthew, He says, that if your brother offends you or you're offended, you offend your brother, you're to go and you make peace with him and then go to the altar and offer your gift. You can't offer the gift and it be accepted until you first make reconciliation with your brother that you have an issue with. And it is the same case with God Almighty. It is God that we have offended and it is God that we must be reconciled with. Therefore, it must be God who comes down into time and takes on a human body like ours. And in that process of doing that, now he can make that reconciliation and he can bring us back into a right relationship with God. And he can also make us in 
having fellowship with God once again. That is what the Bible is teaching us. All right, let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49.26 The Bible says, And I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. He does that in the book of Revelation. And they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior. Who's the Savior in the New Testament? It is Jesus Christ. And thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. I want you to notice what God says here. He says, I am the Lord, thy Savior, and thy Redeemer. The Mighty One of Jacob. And it is going to be God who shows up and rescues those Jews from their enemies at the end of the tribulation period. Why? Because He is the one that redeemed them. He is the one that saved them. Take your Bible and look at Matthew chapter 1, and you'll see it clearly. <coughs> Excuse me for this coughing. Uh, Matthew chapter 1. And look at verse 21. The Bible says, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. That is what God did at the Incarnation. That is what the purpose of the Incarnation was. He redeemed his people. He saved them. He purchased them. We'll look at those terms a little bit more later. <clears throat> Alright, let's go to Isaiah um, chapter 54, verse 5. Isaiah 54, verse 5. The Bible says, For thy maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Notice in this passage here, the Bible says that the, the Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is the God of the whole earth. And he is thy husband. Again, God is identifying himself to Israel as being their Redeemer. And he is telling them that he is the one that is going to be their husband. He is their husband. He is their maker. And he is the God of the whole earth. And one day, the whole earth is going to recognize that because God is going to come back in that physical body that he took on at the incarnation and he's going to sit on the throne of David and he is going to reign over the house of Israel and all his enemies will be his footstool. Take your Bible and look at Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verse 16. The Bible says, Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledges not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our Redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. The Bible tells you here in this passage that the Lord is their Father and their Redeemer. And it is an everlasting name that's attached to that Redeemer. 
Alright, let's go down here to Nehemiah, chapter 1. Nehemiah, chapter 1. And look at verse 10. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. Now I want you to notice in this passage that the word redeem there is in the past tense. God has redeemed them from the house of bondage here. He has redeemed them from the physical uh, slavery that they were under in Egypt under Pharaoh. But I want you to understand something. Redemption goes further than physical deliverance. It goes into a spiritual deliverance that will be taking place at the Incarnation. And I want you to get the scriptures on this because this is going to show you that not only is redemption past tense, it's present tense, and it's also going to be future tense. And that's also true in the lives of believers. You have been redeemed at Calvary from your sins. And you are being redeemed now, and you are going to be redeemed in the future physically. This body is going to take shape and take on the image of Jesus Christ. That is at the rapture. But we'll get into that later. Take your Bible and go to Deuteronomy. Chapter 9. And look at verse 26. Verse 26, it says, I pray therefore unto the Lord... And said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Bible says here that the redemption that God brings is past tense in connection to Egypt. But notice who's doing the redeeming. It is the Lord God. And this is the theme of all throughout the Old Testament, when it comes to being the Redeemer, it is always in reference to God being the one that is redeeming them. He is Israel's Redeemer. He is the church's Redeemer. Take your Bible and look at Hosea. Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14. In verse 14 the Bible says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Now in this verse you'll notice that he says he's going to redeem them from death. He is going to ransom them from the power of the grave. Now, in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55, the Bible quotes this verse as a, as a uh, reference to the rapture of the believers. So Paul makes a spiritual application to this verse and brings it in relationship to you and I being redeemed at the rapture, our bodies getting set free from this corruption and putting on incorruption and immortality. <clears throat> now, that's important because when, God, when Paul makes that reference, he's showing that it is Jesus Christ doing it. In the Old Testament, it's a reference to God Almighty doing it. So they are one and the same. He's bringing the two together to, so you understand that the Redeemer is the Lord Himself. It is God Himself. Take your Bible and go to Psalm 49. Psalm 
in Psalm 49. And let's go to verse 15. Psalm 49, 15, look at what it says here. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me, Selah. Now here, I want to point out something that's very important to notice. Notice it says he's going to redeem his soul from the power of the grave. In the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament believers wound up going to Abraham's bosom. They went down into a protected part of the earth until Jesus Christ come to liberate them from the power of the grave. So we understand here that when he says this, he's speaking in the Old Testament context. And he's not referring to something that continues on into the New Testament. Your soul, when you die, it goes straight to heaven if you're saved. In the Old Testament, it went down. In the New Testament, it goes up. Anything after Calvary, when Jesus shed his blood, it go, it, that person goes up, not down. But I want you to notice that God redeemed his soul from the power of the grave. That grave could not keep him down. That grave could not keep him trapped. It's not going to keep you trapped either if you're born again. God says He will redeem you. God says He will set you free. He will liberate you from what is holding you down by these, um, what do you call them, the uh, elements of this world and the sinful uh, things that are attached to them. That's what's keeping you down right now. But one day, God is going to liberate you. And He's going to set you free and give you a body that is not going to be able to be held down. Praise the Lord. Look at Psalm 19, verse 14. Psalm 19, verse 14. This verse says, Let the words of my mouth uh, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Now, here, David is talking and he says that the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart, he's asking God to let them be acceptable in his sight. Why? Because the Lord is his strength and the Lord is his redeemer. Let me share something with you, my friend. If Jesus Christ is your savior and he is your redeemer, then that redemption extends beyond just you being set free from hell. It goes beyond just you getting saved from hell. It also sets you free and he redeemed your mouth. And he redeemed your thoughts so that you can talk right and you can think right. Jesus Christ redeemed your words. He redeemed your thought patterns. I get amazed at how many Christians today have the most filthy, vile language, just like anybody in the world that doesn't know Jesus Christ. And they don't even blink an eye. They talk just like the world. They talk just as filthy as the world, and they use all kinds of profanity, just like any unsaved man. And I'm here to tell you today that when Jesus Christ redeemed you, He not only redeemed you from hell, He redeemed you so that you could talk right, so that you could think right, so that you could walk right, and so that you could be right. That's the Word of God, my friend. So David in that context is saying, let the words 
of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight. And the meditation. What are you thinking about today, Christian? What are you talking about today? When people look at you and listen to you and listen to your conversation, do they know you've been with Jesus? Do they know that you have a relationship with God? Or do they respond by saying, oh, he's just a hypocrite. Yeah, he's one of those people that talks one way and lives another. See that thing? Or he's one of those people that talks one way in front of certain people and talks another way in front of other people. My friend, what are you talking about? Are your words acceptable in the sight of God? Does He honor your words because your words fall in line with the Holy Scriptures? What are you thinking about today? How about when nobody else is around? You see, God is there when everybody else is gone. God is watching you when everybody else has left the building. What are you thinking about? What are your thoughts, my friend? Jesus Christ redeemed you so that you could think right. He redeemed you so you could talk right. Paul says, let no filthy, corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Paul says, let your words be the words of the Lord. I'm paraphrasing now. If a man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. What's the oracles of God? This book right here, the scriptures. Does your speech line up with the word of God? Does your lifestyle line up with the word of God? See, redemption is so much bigger than what happened to you that moment that you got in the altar and you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save your soul, and you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ as it was presented to you, it is something that also redeems you from this present evil world and all the things that go along with it. Jesus Christ wants you to be a light in this darkness that's around us. He's your Redeemer. When Peter got out of line, the woman that was sitting next to him warming herself by the fire, and he starts using profanity, she said, your speech is betraying you. We know you're one of his. He couldn't even cuss right. Christians, it's time that we not just talk the talk, but we walk the walk. It's time that we, as born-again believers, start showing the world who the Redeemer is and that they can see the Redeemer in us. In our speech, out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible says, the mouth will speak. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Moving right along. The Bible says in Psalm 78 verse 35. And they remembered. Are you remembering some things today? And they remembered that God was their rock, not St. Peter. And the high God, their Redeemer. He is the high God today. He is the God that is above every God. 
He is the God of gods. He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. And nobody is on His level. And I mean nobody. Not Allah, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Hare Krishna, not Confucius, nobody. Not the Pope in Rome, not Saint Mar not, not Mary, or any other saint. We're below Him. We're at His feet. And that's where we should stay. At the feet of Jesus Christ. Because He is the High God. And He is our Redeemer. Now, go to Job. Job chapter 19. I get thinking about some of this stuff. I get excited. I start wanting to really get with it now. Because this stuff really stirs me up on my heart. I get to thinking about what God did and what He's doing and what He's going to do. Job chapter 19, verse 25. Job in the midst of his pain. Job in the midst of his sorrow. Job after losing his family. After losing his health. After losing his job, after losing his livelihood, after losing his friends, after losing everything and laying in a pit of sorrow, pain and suffering, here's what he says. He says in verse 25, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. He's prophesying about the day when the Redeemer, which is the Lord God Almighty of the Old Testament, is going to come down, take on a human body, and walk among men, just like the Bible says in John chapter 1, and dwell among men. The Bible says He will live in that last day. He will stand upon the earth. And though after my, after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh... Shall I see God? Job had an understanding that no matter what happened to him, no matter what was going on inside of his body, no matter what was going on with his family, no matter what was going on on his job, no matter what was going on in his neighborhood with his friends, he understood that one day God is going to take that vile body and change it and fashion it like unto his glorious body. And that he would come out on top in the end. He said, I know my Redeemer lives. I know it. Verse 27, for I shall see my, for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. You take this old body and lay it in the ground, you can bury it with a shovel. And they probably will one day if the Lord tarries. As a matter of fact, it's pretty much guaranteed that if you live long enough and the Lord tarries long enough, you're going to die, you're going to go in the ground, they're going to bury you with a shovel. But once they bury that body, that's not the end of the story. Once that body deteriorates, that's not the end of the story. Once that body is consumed by the worms, that's not the end of the story. Because God is going to take that corruptible, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, and he's going to take that vile body, Paul described it as such in his letter in Philippians, and he's going to change and fashion it like unto his glorious body, and it's going to come out of that grave, it's going to come out of that place where it's trapped, and God is going to glorify that body and bring it up into heaven, into the very presence of God, to live with Him forever, and we will rejoice. And then we'll understand, uh, even better then than we do now, that my, my Redeemer liveth. He's alive forevermore. Now, let's go to 1 
us talk about the Incarnation and what is required. There's, there's three things required for the Incarnation to uh, be real. Number one, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. A body is required. A body. God had to walk and take on a physical human body. Why? Because you have a physical human body. And it is in this physical human body that you offended God. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. A body. It is required that a human body he takes. The Bible says here, notice the wording, But a body hast thou prepared. Me. Jesus Christ had to have a human body. He had to walk among us in flesh. He didn't just make an appearance. It wasn't an illusion. Like the early Gnostics said, as a matter of fact, if you'll go to 1 John chapter 4, he makes it clear that it is real flesh that Jesus Christ took on. And if you don't believe that, you're under a spell and you're under a doctrine of devils. The Bible says in verse 1 of 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, see that thing, is of God. They had a real problem with that in the second century. Even in Paul's time and John's time, they were starting to have heretics rising up in the ranks that were denying the fact that Jesus Christ truly took on human flesh. Look at verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Where have you have heard that it should come? And even now already is it in the world. The second thing that is required in the incarnation is death. A specific kind of death. Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verse... 15, Hebrews 9, 15, the Bible says in verse 15, well let's go back to verse 14 because it's going to give you some context in what, in what I said, look at verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yes, you have to, you have to understand the incarnation not only requires that God takes on a human body, it also requires that that human body be sacrificed on the altar of Calvary and shed blood and die for the sins of mankind. As a matter of fact, that is the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Third thing that's required 
is the resurrection of that body that has died. The Bible says that Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. He had to die. But he didn't stay dead. And the gospel makes it plain that you must not only believe that he died for your sins, but that he was buried and he rose again. 1 Corinthians 15.1 Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I, I also received, how that Christ died, there it is, for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, my friend, we must believe this is part of the Gospel. If you don't believe this, you're not saved. We must believe that Jesus Christ took on a human body, flesh. And we also must believe in that, that He died for our sins. But we don't stop there. We also must believe that He was buried. Alright? The act was completed, basically. But then, we also must believe on the other side of that, that He rose up. Because the Bible makes it plain in chapter 15, verse 14, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If we don't understand this part of the gospel correctly, we are going to damn people to hell. Because there's a group of people out there today that are teaching the heresy that Jesus Christ only rose spiritually out of the tomb, not physically. That is a heresy that God condemns, the scriptures condemn, and if you believe that heresy, you will die lost. You must believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Thank God he did. The Bible says in verse 17, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. So you got to believe that. you got to believe it just like God said it. Alright. The next thing you need to understand is redemption requires that blood be shed. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9.22 Hebrews 9.22 Hebrews 9.22 says this, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. There's no remission outside the shedding of blood. Blood is required to be shed in order to remit the sins of the transgressor. It doesn't matter what John MacArthur says or any of these other heretics that are running around and saying it's not the blood of Christ that is important, it's the death of Christ that's important. Well, if it's just the death of Christ that's important, he could have jumped off of an Empire State Building somewhere. He could have jumped off the temple and committed suicide. He could have hung himself. They could have uh, thrown him off the side of a cliff and he would have been just as uh, much of a savior to us as he would if he had shed the blood. We wouldn't have had to go through that bloody sacrifice. But the Bible tells you that Jesus had to be a bloody sacrifice for your sins because in, without that shedding of blood, there is no remission. If you go to Colossians chapter 1, he makes this plain. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. 
The Bible says here in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. He makes it clear again a second time. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible says, In whom we have redemption, through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. You can't be saved without the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, because it's the blood, not just the death, that saves you and redeems you. Take your Bible and go to Romans. Chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, the Bible makes it clear again. The Bible says, Much more than being now justified by His blood, and I don't mean death, by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Romans chapter 3 verse 25 says it again. Romans 3.25 The Bible says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now, propitiation, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, it means atonement, atoning, victim, appease, to placate. Um, basically, it takes you to a place where God is appeased by the act. And the only way God is going to be appeased is if you have faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's what appeases God. That's what placates Him. That's what satisfies God and removes the judicial displeasure of God. Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Verse 28. The Bible says, Take, care, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. To feed the church of God, watch it, which he hath purchased with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood. It is that blood that was shed that redeems and that met the requirement that God demanded to get you saved. Only God's blood can do it. Therefore, redemption requires blood to be shed. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 18. The Bible says, And all things are of God, which hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To it that God was in Christ, watch it, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be you reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. What God is saying in this passage is, in order to be reconciled, God had to come in the person of Jesus Christ, and He had to bring the reconciliation, and He had to make reconciliation through the body of His Son, Jesus Christ, and He did it at Calvary on the cross when He shed His blood for our sins. That is what the blood does in connection to redemption. So the angel of the Lord that we've covered earlier is Jesus Christ. 
And the angel of the Lord had to take on a permanent manifestation in the person of Jesus Christ. And that person, Jesus Christ, is our Lord and our God. And it is God's blood that was shed for us that brings us back into a right relationship with the Lord. Thank God for His everlasting mercy and grace. All right, we're going to stop right there today and conclude right there. We'll pick it back up next time. Again, um, I apologize that my voice is kind of raspy and I'm struggling to talk right now because I'm still getting over the sinus stuff. But um, I hope you got something out of this today. I hope it was a blessing. This covers the material that we did last week that was missing. So I hope it was a blessing to you. God bless you in Jesus' name.